and welcome to the first session of Sustainable House Day 2023. I'm Fiona Gray, CEO of Renew. I've been in this role for about eight months, so this is my first Sustainable House Day. So I am super excited and we have a huge crowd joining us. So that's wonderful to see so many people really excited about sustainable house, about sustainable homes as well. As Anna just acknowledged, we're all joining from different Aboriginal lands today. I'm joining you from Wadawurrung country, from my home on the banks of the beautiful Murrabul River. First up, we're talking about owner building. We got some great, we've got some great homeowners joining us today, as well as building designer and owner builder expert, Kirsty Wolfe who works with owner builders to create sustainable, natural, healthy buildings. And that's obviously what we're all about at Renew. Before we get started, I'll give you a brief overview of the homeowners joining us. All of them have provided house profiles that can be viewed on our website with photos, uh, house tours, videos, um, detailed sustainability credentials. So you can really drill down into learning more about these homes. You can also continue the conversation and make further inquiries in the comments section. So we encourage you to have a look and we'll, we've shared the links in the chat. So first up, we have James Goodlett, architect and owner of Harry House, a beautiful owner builder project from Anglesey, Victoria. Harry House is a 138 metre squared, functional, flexible, livable and really uncompromising home with a really modest footprint. So welcome, James. Welcome, Kirsty. I see you just turned on as well. Thank you. Thank also, you. Join, also joining us is Roger Vorhoover, architect and owner of Goolwa House, located in Goolwa, South Australia. Roger's home is a stunning Scandinavian style, owner-built home with multifunctional living space that accommodates different setups, whether you're um, accommodating your family or as many of us are doing now, working from home. Thank you. Today, welcome. <laughs> Today we are also going to be joined, we were also going to be joined by Benjamin Bailey Webb, owner-builder and resident at Nook on the Hill, located in Halls Gap, Victoria. Now, Benjamin is a firefighter and given the, the, the fires that have been breaking out uh, yesterday with pretty horrendous conditions, he's actually fighting a fire. So unfortunately he can't join us today. However, I also encourage you to go and look at Benjamin's build, um, which we will put in the chat. So Nook on the Hill is a double story, single bedroom home that uses many recycled materials for its construction. Uh, the design philosophy of the Nook has always followed one of minimal impact that aims to exploit maximum function, functionality for its tiny 24 metre square footprint. So that's, thank you everyone for joining us. Um, and yeah, let's get stuck into it. Okay, so let's start with what it means to be an owner builder. Why should I consider becoming an owner builder? Kirsty, would you like to start us off? Yeah, I will. Look, the first thing most people think of when they look at becoming an owner builder is the cost savings. And the answer is yes, you can save money um, by doing some of the work yourself, uh, sourcing materials, uh, selecting particular suppliers or contractors and getting various quotes for those, um, those aspects of it. Um, but the issue is most owner builders don't actually put a dollar value on their time and owner building takes a lot of time. So people need to be aware that if you're going to take on the role of an owner builder, you need to balance um, how much time you're going to be able to commit to that project with what other commitments you have in your life um, and how much time you can possibly sort of dedicate to the building project. Um, another th thing that people sort of want to do with owner building is that they want to create something that's unique and personalised and they want to do it themselves. Um, and often the build becomes then a creative outlet. Um, now, being an owner builder can mean that you do work yourself, but it doesn't have to. The owner builder is effectively the building manager. So people can actually become an owner builder and subcontract all the work, but they are the person who's ultimately in control of that work. Um, so as an owner builder, you can actually choose how much work you physically do yourself and how much you subcontract out. And so that issue of control over the project 
And also flexibility in running the project is another reason why people look at doing owner building. Um, sometimes people choose to build in a particular way. They want to manage the timing of the project. They have to work it around their own work commitments. And so owner building means that you are the boss. You're the person in charge and you can then control when things are done, how they're done, selecting materials um, and details, and you can then work at your own pace. Um, be aware, everything takes longer than you think. Um, mm -hmm. When I was an owner builder, someone gave me some great advice, which was when you're at lockup, you're only halfway, which I think yeah. is very, very wise and very true. Yeah. But getting out of owner building, people can often get a real sense of achievement. And this was one of the unexpected things that I actually got out of owner building. And uh, also sort of talking with uh, a lot of women who've been owner builders in particular, there's a real sense of empowerment in being able to manage and control a project and see something being built, something really substantial. Um, so you can actually get a lot out of owner building. And last but not least, um, fun. Um, there are people out there like me um, who actually enjoy building and, and having a, an owner builder project can actually be a bit of a, uh, a source of sort of uh, recreation as well as a productive uh, endeavor. Um, but however, it's not quite like, you know, going out and playing a round of golf on a Saturday morning once a week. Uh, being an owner builder is much more um, in all encompassing than that. And it will take up a lot of time. So as well as being fun, you've just got to remember that sort of commitment in terms of responsibility and time. I love that, Kirsty. Given that um, and so many of us are very familiar with grand designs, and it often doesn't look like a lot of fun for for some owner builders. So it's great to bring that perspective to it. And also, I love that you talk about the creativity. I live in an owner built home. I did not build it myself. It, it was built in 1989, but the creativity is really evident in this house. It's got all these lovely little quirky things that you wouldn't get in a standard build. So uh, some great points there. To the, to the whole panel, as an owner builder, and anyone can jump in here, you know, there, there's been so many considerations before kicking off on your journey. I'm sure there was. So how did you get started on your journey to your own owner built home? Who wants to kick off? Good question. I'm not sure about you, Roger, but uh, yeah, I guess I, I started with the uh, the intent that uh, we, well, we would, we, we design houses for, for, for a living. So it was a bit of a no-brainer that we're in this kind of game. And so for us, uh, we were going to be pretty uh, heavily involved. So um, so it was that pathway for, for me seemed to make sense. Uh, having had a lot of experience dealing with trades and, and so forth, I had the comfort uh, and confidence that that wasn't going to be a problem. Um, and yeah, I think that's probably one of the things that I would uh, I would definitely recommend people consider is how do you communicate, um, especially with the trades and the things that you're not doing, and how how comfortable are you? I, I think at the start, setting real expectations. Like um, we were trying to achieve passive house levels, so uh, we were bringing in local trades that hadn't had any experience in in detailing in that way. Um, so we just wanted to be sure that they were they were up for that kind of challenge and that we could uh, guide them along the way. So um, that's sort of at the start and during the build, but then also think about the defect at the end. Uh, you know, have you got the courage to call them out and get them back to fix the, those kind of things so that you're not left with those troubles? Because at, at, at the end of the day, as an owner builder, you take all the risk. So um, yeah, so I think you want to you want to be sure that. Uh, Who's helping you get there um, is 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 up to the task and uh, and aware of your situation. So yeah, I think communication is really important. That's a great point, James. And we've actually got an extension session as well about creating the team and and mm -hmm. you know having having the right people around you. So um, that's really valuable. And it, it is it's quite a skill to call out the defects and manage that process. Um, it can be a challenging process. So yeah, good it can it feels confrontational, but at the end of the day, you're creating a new house or new alts and ads. You you expect the best that you can. Um, so yeah, it's 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 definitely worth uh, bearing in mind. 
Yeah. Sure. Roger, how about you? So how do you, the question was, how do you start? Mm. I, I think it, it was desire to do it, really. I think that was uh, what was the, the driving force all the time. So um, yeah, you start off with buying a block of land that has the right orientation and everything, and then get all your approvals. That was my business, so, or that is my business. So that was not so difficult for me to get all the approvals. But then I really, you need to get your team ready and building a house, you know, you need a lot of endurance and patience. Um, but what I've really learned from it as well is you can't plan everything. And I worked it out with my son. Eh? My son helped me for a year and he was 20. And they, you know, they have a bit of a different mindset when they're in the 20s, you know, they just get on with things, you know, and that was really important throughout the whole build as well. You know, it's really good to plan a lot of things, but you also need, okay, let's just go. And then the next stage will unfold by itself. You know, you, it, it's really, it's, it's a beautiful process. Of course, you need to know where you're heading to, but it's also really nice. Just go with that flow. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, touching on that, having that fire in the belly, you know, I think if you've got that fire in your belly to achieve uh, something like this, it's such a rewarding thing to do. It is. And it is, it, it was for me absolutely necessary to have it because um, I think Kirsty was saying that, you know, at lock up you're at 50%. And absolutely, that's true. And it is actually a little bit shocking because you've spent so much time on it. And, you know, um, I, I'm in my early 50s, so your body is really taking all that uh, toll as well. And then you still have to do the other 50%, and especially the last 10% takes so much time, you know, finishing it completely. And I, that's what I really wanted, you know, I really want to have it completely finished before you move in or because otherwise a building can be unfinished for years which some people find okay, but I really had something, well, I'd really like to have a start and a finish, you know, and working. Yeah, that, you know. I, yeah. I think, I, think I, I can agree with, uh, you need that patience, especially yeah. towards the end. Like we were living in pretty primitive kind of conditions <laughs> while we were uh, waiting to move into our house. So that we, the jump and the, and the eagerness to get in was definitely there, but Holding, holding tight to make sure everything was done and executed properly was was pretty important. And then, oh, looping back to the start, one thing I did was set up a Gantt chart, and uh, like I do, I deal with a lot of builders, so I was like uh, getting their Gantt charts, and I thought this was going to be great that I could plot this all out. Great for sequence, forget about time, especially if you're <laughs> COVID and you're an owner builder. Uh, and as Roger was saying, you've just got to take one step at a time and uh, and focus on that task at hand rather than be overwhelmed by everything that's 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 going on. Uh, yeah, sure, there, there are some lead times with certain things and and that kind of organisation, but there's only so much you can tackle at at one time. Well, while you're still trying to run a business and work. <laughs> so. And the nature of building, you know, there's always variables that are beyond your control. So actually being able to just go with the flow a little bit yeah. Is, yeah. is really important. Otherwise, it becomes quite stressful. Yeah. So, um, Roger, you did touch on something around. Um, so, so we're talking about, you know, having that dedication to the cause, I suppose. But then it can also be daunting for people who don't have specialist skills. Um, and, and so, you know, the idea of building their own home may feel unattainable. Just wondering what skills were essential for you to complete your build and how did you go about learning those skills? Um, you know, before you start building, you need a lot of skills as well, which are really important. So actually, before a construction starts, you need a lot of organization skills, you know, get everything organized your approvals, your consultancy, and how you plan it all, and your team that we just spoke of, you know, and um, uh, once that is all set, an another really important aspect is budgeting. 
we um, I, I, every week I just put all the numbers into the, the spreadsheets and just looked at where we were with the budget and you know that gave me so much more peace of mind all the time because we were running on budget all the time it was not a, a moment that we were just out so that, that was just great and the other thing was that you have somebody, in my case, it was my son, where you can always count on, you know, that you do the work together. Uh, I think two people who are working is almost equivalent to three people, or maybe even four, you know, because you need that motivation, but also that extra hand and, yeah. And then you start construction. And of course, uh, you need to be practical and you need to have good, skills like carpentry or a little bit of plumbing a little bit of roofing a little bit of flashing how to put windows in and but you le learn on the job as well it's it's not something uh, a, a couple of things were quite foreign for me before i started but uh, you can you can ask the local tradies or in my case i had a friend who's a builder and i could ask him he helped me with uh, brick laying for example so we did that together so the first day it's a bit difficult, but the second day, you know, you, you get those skills. But of course, you need a bit of an uh, have a bit of a talent with practical uh, things. Yeah. Um, so that that's more practical on on site as well. But um, I worked with my son for four days a week, and always Friday we didn't work, and he just took off and did the things he wanted to do. You know. And Friday was my office day, you know, and I was really organizing materials, organizing the tradies, get my budget, all the other things, get the shop drawings ready. Um, I made a lot of drawings during the whole uh, time. Also, just that you can order stuff exactly the size you wanted or the, uh, the amount of materials you need. So we hardly, hardly had any waste on site. So I just dedicated one day to do all that office work. And I think all up, yeah, that worked out really well. So you need a bit of an all-rounder on site, but you also need to have quite good organization skills. Yeah. Excellent. Kirsty, what do you think? What, what other specialist skills would you think you need to bring to a build, being an expert in this space as well? I, I think the, the most important thing, and what I actually often ask clients is, what are your skills? And how are you going to find the skills you don't have? Mm. So it's about actually, you think people think of an owner builder as I'm doing everything, but that's actually not the case. You're actually putting together a team and the owner builder is really the person who's just in control of that team and putting that team together. So my thing is often owner builders don't have connections in the industry like builders do, but uh, James is talking about the importance of communication as an owner builder. Talk to people, ask people, what are your recommendations? Have you talked to... Um, I remember when I was an owner builder, I was looking at doing polished concrete. I went to the concrete showroom and said, oh, you know, who can I get to do this? And then I called to talk to someone else and they recommended the same concreters. And so when I got recommendations from three different people for the same concreters, I thought I must be onto something good here. Um, so it's about sort of finding out who can do all those skills and do those things that you can't do um, and, and putting together a, a team that uh, you can rely on. Um, so yeah, finding tradies that, uh, that you can rely on is just so important. I mean, I had the most fantastic plumber. He, whenever we, we sort of spoke and he said, I'll do it, he absolutely always did it. Didn't even need to follow it up. And they're the kind of things that as an owner builder, um, you know, you really wanna have those sort of reliable um, uh, people to work with. And it's sort of, it's harder to build those relationships, but Yes, asking for recommendations, talking to people, uh, talking to people in your area, finding people who are local, um, all of those things are, are really important. The, the other thing is one of the real skills you need is organisation. So as an owner builder, you are the organiser. You have to think ahead and think, okay, I'm probably gonna start um, you know, the roof in four weeks time. How long is the lead time before I need to order my roofing material? And so that, that's, that's sort of, I think, where um, an owner builder can really either do brilliantly or you know, end up taking a lot more time is thinking ahead, thinking ahead, what's coming up next? How long will it take me to get those materials? 
Have I got a quote? Is my tradesperson available to do that? All of those sorts of things, because ultimately, as an owner builder, you are a person in charge and you have to take on that role. So many moving parts. So that I think those organisation skills really come into their own. But also to that um, idea of partnership, like you really do need to have um, a great relationship with all of your trades um, in order to make it work and, and feel like you're, you're all pulling in the same direction. Renew is a non-profit membership organisation. Along with running Sustainable House Day, we also inform government policy, advocate for a fair energy transition, provide resources for climate disaster resilience, and publish two magazines. Sanctuary Magazine provides trusted independent information for people looking to build or innovate sustainably. Renew Magazine is a leading voice on sustainable technology developments shaping the energy transition. These magazines grew from member newsletters in the 1980s and still maintain their grassroots independence and practical approach. Both are incredible resources and subscribing is a great way to support us to transform Australian homes for climate and energy resilience. James, Harry House is a really um, beautiful example, I think, of what's possible as an owner builder. Interested to know, um, you know, from the practical perspective, how long did it take and how did you manage your time throughout the whole process? Hmm. Am I allowed to take deductions out because of uh, material delays or? <laughs> well, actually, given the climate, I think that's a really important part of the discussion, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah I mean, hopefully things have uh, smoothed out now. I guess we were in... Uh... Uh, mid 2020 when we were sorry 2021 when we really hit the ground running and started the groundworks but I'd say overall it probably took 16 months then because yeah we didn't really start framing until December um, we just couldn't get timber and, and ended up scrounging uh, everywhere so yeah, yeah one day when somebody pulls his house apart and they see the multicolor framing of all the different bits and pieces that we could find <laughs> like it was literally, uh, it was literally like that. So, um, yeah, it took it took time, and um, but we'll, yeah, like I was sort of suggesting before, it was that that conflict between wanting to be in and getting it done, but also taking the time to execute it properly was uh, was pretty pretty critical. So, yeah, great. Yeah. Okay. Um. I'm conscious that we're getting a heap of questions coming through. So I'll just ask you all one more question and then we'll um, get to the questions from our audience. And uh, we won't be able to get to all of the questions, but we'll, we'll do our best. Um, but just, just to sort of wrap up before we head to that section, anything else you think is important for owner builders to know based on your journey? Uh, my, my thing, I can see that a lot of questions are coming through on how do you start? You know, you want to become an owner builder. You don't really have a background in building. Where do you sort of, where do you sort of, you know, find all that sort of background? So at least in New South Wales, you need to have done an owner builder course. Um, and most of those provide actually some quite sort of uh, useful material in relation to um, sequencing contracts, um, those sorts of things, which can give you an idea about those roles of being a manager. They even talk about, um, uh you know, how do, how do you sort of put that uh, sequencing sort of together, the order of trades. There's a couple of also um, really good books out there. Um, there's one called uh, Building Your Own Home um, and another one called The Australian House Building Manual. Um, uh, someone Staines is the, is the author of that. And, and those two books are really good primers just in terms of how do you build a house? They're really understandable by the average person and it can give you the language to use when you're talking to your contractors. It can give you an idea about what to expect in terms of the house going together. Um, and they're just a really good uh, starting point. So often when I'm working with owner builders, I'll actually lend them some copies of those books um, just to sort of go through and so that they can actually feel a bit more confident um, in terms of the building process um, and, and how things go together. 
Just on that, though, they're great resources. Thanks for pointing to those, Kirsty. Um, do you think owner builders also need one? This is a question that's come in from Jane, which is uh, quite topical around this. Do you think owner builders need to purchase and become familiar with the National Construction Code and Australian standards? Or how do you work with your building surveyor in that regard? Well, they don't need to purchase the National, National Construction Code because that, that's free, <laughs> that's available online. So. Yeah. Um, yeah. really worthwhile having a look at that. Um, and really, it, I mean, it's it's going to be really difficult for anyone. The stand, to so the, but just, to, just to point out, though, the National Construction Code is, but Australian standards aren't, and they're quite correct. expensive. I'll, yes. I'll get to that yeah. one. Sorry. Um, <laughs> so, so just in, in terms of that, but with the National Construction Code, it might be, it's not the kind of thing you can just start at the beginning and read all the way through. It's more a case of as questions come up, or things come up that you're not quite sure about, then referring back to the NCC is a, is a good thing to do. Um, standards are a little bit more difficult because they are not available freely um, and that yes, you need to pay for them. However, a number of local libraries will have them available. Um, so contact your local library and check out if, um, if they're available there. Um, it could also be if you're engaging specialist trades, they may have access to those as well. Um, also, there are some uh, great things that online that you can get which sort of summarise those. So um, there, there's some other, other alternatives um, because also the Australian standards can sometimes be quite dense uh, in terms of reading for someone who's not familiar with the material. But it would be in some circumstances that they may be critical, like to get yourself across waterproofing in wet yeah. areas, for example, like that is risky kind of building in those areas so um yeah. in terms of that there's actually a lot of material online which is actually for training yeah. um so people who are doing sort of TAFE courses and that they often put a lot of the the subject material online so people who are studying building and those sorts of things and a lot of that's actually available so um a good google search can actually come up with a surprising amount of relevant information um, however, you do need to be discerning about um, where that information is coming from. So if it's coming from a reputable training organisation, then you're you know, pretty right in terms of trusting that. Um, if it's just coming from um, some unknown source, then I'd, I'd sort of be questionable. Great. Um, Roger, um, perhaps you can address this one. This is a question from Margaret, just talking about the inspection processes um, private certification and 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 getting that final certificate. Um, what should lay uh, what should lay people in the industry know about getting those approvals? Yeah, um, that is pretty important. Uh, first of all, of course, you got your um, full development approval before you make a start on site. And that was actually uh, what I wanted to add to the previous conversation. You know, I think really good drawings are. Uh, a very necessary part before you start, you know, and having that really good relationship with, with your designer as well, so that he really guides you through. So that was just uh, what I want to add. Um, just on that, I think that is that principle of, um, you know, measure twice, cut once. It's the same with, um, with drawings. It's much easier to draw it and get your drawings right than it is to start building it and realise you've got to make changes then. Yeah, exactly. And also the drawings also determine the sequence of the building, you know, so if, if, if the drawings um, are not so complicated and not all things are, all the information is in one drawing, but for example, you've got a drawing just for the slab, just for the timber framing, just for the windows, makes it so much easier for somebody to manage the whole build, you know, and also get the traders involved and get quite quickly in understanding what's going on. So I would just simplify the drawings and yeah, give them to the trade is what, what they exactly need and not all the other information, yeah. So that was that part. Uh, what was your question again? It, it was around the inspection processes, the getting inspect the, your yeah. final certificates and that sort of thing. How yeah. to let people go about doing that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, that's required. So um, you just need somebody to, um, you can ask a private certifier or a builder. I use the builder in this case. Um, there's a big, there's a big yeah. gap though, because isn't there, Roger? Like we we have mandatory inspections for foundations and yeah. and, and you know uh, and slabs, and then we go to framing, and then there's this massive gap until we get to completion, right? 
And whatever yeah, exactly. happens in between there is yeah. really great. So, so for argument's sake, you go and get your energy rating. It's saying you're doing this in the walls. Nobody's actually going to check that properly. No. That's the biggest problem with our industry. So I think as an owner builder, um, managing uh, that expectation that nobody's really there from a from a I guess a, a legal point of view to actually support you um, through through that. And I think you know just using a insulation as an example, like it's true important that it gets installed properly. Um, and and if you're engaging somebody to do that. Um, I'd, I'd recommend getting an independent inspector in to, to make sure that that actually got executed properly. Um, or if you're doing it yourself, as Kirsty was saying before, school off a bit online, there's a few, uh, few trainings and how-tos on those sort of things. Um, my, my thing also would be read your development approval carefully, read your construction certificate carefully in terms of what documents are required. So all of those conditions in your... Um, either planning approval or um, development application, uh, development approval, depending on what state you're in, um, you need to make sure you comply with those. And so you need to make sure what document, do you need documentary evidence showing that you comply with those? And it's much easier to get that as you go along. So um, if you need proof showing that your termite barriers have been put in, get that certificate when the termite guy comes or uh, termite person, sorry, comes or straight afterwards. Um, so that you're not having to chase those things up later. Get that certificate for your waterproofing when your yeah. waterproofing is done so that at the end, when you're asking for your occupation certificate, you have all that documentation yeah. available. Yeah, exactly. That's, that's what I want to say as well. Every trade who's finishing his job, just ask for that uh, certificate. Just bind them all in. And at the end, you know, you've got everything covered. Yeah. And Great it's a bit like what, what James is saying as well, you know, there is, before they pour your slab, you know, you get that checkpoint um, when the timber framing is all up and then it's a bit of a gray area, but you want your quality built anyways, built anyway, so you, you need to check everything, yeah. Absolutely. Can you, so it sort of touches on this idea of quality. Um, can you talk a little bit about, and any one of you can respond to this, about insurances required for owner builders? I'll, I'll, I'll jump in there. Um, in, terms, in terms of insurance, there's a couple <laughs> of different things. There's, there's sort of the liability insurance for what happens on the site, and then there's insurance for the works. So in terms of that, two different things. One, you're insuring the work that's already been done. So, you know, you've got your... Yeah. your frame up and a tree falls on it you want to be covered for that or you get your frame delivered to site and someone steals part of it you want to make sure you're covered for that but in terms of um, public liability I mean uh, you've got to be careful about you know who is covered um, have you just got insurance for the works and not for people if you're having volunteers on site are they covered in your um, public liability insurance um, all of your trades should have their own. That's something you might want to ask them when they're um, when you're engaging them. Um, and reading the um, actual policy that you're getting carefully to find out, particularly in terms of volunteers uh, and people on site, who is covered and who is not covered. Yeah, I think um, I recall like things like site security and things like that were were sort of mandatory for it to be relevant, I guess, and covered. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Um, there's a lots of questions here, so uh, I know we're not doing a deep dive, but uh, we want to try and get to as many as we can. Um, we've got someone, K Kristen, who is has absolutely no background in building, and they've been um, advised to employ a project manager, but she sort of said, well, does that void all the positives of cost savings, you know, having empower the empowerment over the project, um, how they decide to pace it, you know, bringing that creativity to it. So uh, the question is really, would you suggest a project manager for absolute beginners? Um, in, in terms of having a project manager, they effectively are going to take on that role of the owner builder, which is what the builder would normally take over, yeah. that organisational role. So if you're going to get a project manager, you're not really, I mean, you are technically being an owner builder, but you are contracting out that primary um, responsibility. Um, so if, if they're a bit nervous about that, my thing would be, 
Um, maybe try and get uh, a local builder that you could pay by the hour to ask your questions to. Um, so it's like things like sort of building up that team and that knowledge to sort of say, well, do you have um, sufficient information? So if you're not quite sure, try and get someone that you could perhaps pay to come in, double check the work if you're not quite sure, um, to, to help give you that confidence is my suggestion. Yeah, perhaps just, you know, bringing in that expertise when it's most important at the various steps. Um, Brett has asked, what are the three biggest areas of savings? So, um, you know, what did you actually value as an owner builder? How do you value your own time? Um, and if you value your own time at a certain, you know, dollar yeah. per hour rate, would you still have saved money versus outsourcing? Um, I can say something about that if you like. Absolutely. Yep. Go ahead. <laughs> You've got the yeah, real, so, real world experience uh, here. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, I spent probably 18 months full time on it. So if you calculate that back to a dollar figure, well, what is it? Maybe one and a half, 200,000 or so, something like that, eh? if you just work somewhere. I don't know. So I built a house for about 260,000, including the trades and um, everything. So that was all completed. But if you add my time to it, it's say four and a half, I would say. And if you get somebody to do it as well like that, you know, you probably spend that amount of money then. But I think uh, you will not find a builder who will build it for four and a half in the moment. So I think you still save a lot of money. Yeah. And yeah. it shouldn't, or maybe it should, but maybe we shouldn't use the word should, but I, th I think the drive should be different than just cost saving it. Uh, yeah. um, because the process is too long for that. Mm. Uh, I, I think the drive has to be that you want that unique experience of doing it yourself, hands on, and I can really highly recommend it to everybody to do it because that's what really gets you, uh, you know, excited all the time to get it done. Mm. And you need that drive, huh? you need that drive. Yeah. On, on the flip side, like if you're going into a fixed price contract with a builder, it is, it is set with the expectations are set with everything that you're getting and you're going to be delivered. It's all predetermined. Um, and there's not a lot of flexibility in most cases, right? Um, and then, whereas if you're an owner builder, you, you, I guess, you know, the pathway to completion is completely uh, flexible, but, and, and that is from a cost point of view as well. So like Roger's spreadsheet that he continually checked the balances on as he was going, gave him the flexibility that when he was purchasing things later on in the build, he could make up a bit of that ground yeah. um, and, and has that flexibility within it. So I guess you can't put a dollar figure on how much you're going to save as an owner builder. You could blow out. You could go the other direction. But you, you, the, what, what you're doing is you're taking that power and you're, you're choosing your pathway as you go and pulling levers as you go as well. You could come out of the ground and go, "Wow, I didn't know that I was putting in all that concrete there." And I've now I'm, I'm, I'm in yeah. like fifteen grand or something like that at the moment. Yeah. Like, you know, you just you could get, you could be going the other way and then working backwards from there. But um, yeah, I guess you're empowered to make a few of those yeah. calls along the way. There's a question, um, Kirsty. I might direct this one to you from Ruth. Um, she's saying, what is the absolute first step for an owner-builder project? Is it the design? Is it finding the designer? Do you have to talk to council first? Do you have to organise your finance first? You know, where, where do you actually begin? Uh, that's a good question. I think number one is, do you have the time and skills to actually be an owner-builder? Um, you know, looking, looking that, that first. Um, I'm aware that a lot of owner builders do have issues with obtaining finance. So some institutions are uh, better at working with owner builders than others. Um, there are some mortgage brokers who will specifically find you mortgages that you can get as an owner builder, but certainly um, there are some mortgage mortgages who will not lend to owner builders. Um, so sort of that's something you definitely have to have a look at. Um, in, in terms of council approvals and those sorts of things, your building designer or architect should be able to um, give some good advice in relation to that. Um, 
uh, whether what they're wanting to actually build is able to be done on the site um, and any sort of restrictions on the land and those sorts of things. Um, that would be sort of, I think, so yeah, a good, a good sort of starting point. Um, in terms of the design, um, I, I think that's also as an owner builder, uh, keeping things simple, um, particularly if you're going to be doing the work yourself, have a look at what skills you have. And, you know, um, if, if you're skilled in a particular area, try and maximise that, that use of that skill in your build. Great advice. Um, there's a question here from Jeff. He's mentioned, and you know, we're all very familiar with the, the news stories about, um, the, you know, the cost of materials going through the roof and tradies being, you know, as rare as hen's teeth and is super yeah. expensive. Um, and, you know, but, you know, supply chains are, are starting to settle. Uh, of course, we've still got interest rates increasing. Like it's a pretty interesting dynamic to be working in at the moment. Um, just as an opinion, I suppose, do you expect the cost of materials will come down and the demand for tradies and their costs will also start to come down? What are you seeing? No idea, to be honest. <laughs> no, no, I don't think it can probably... I think it's more that everything will stabilize, um, um, especially with the material cost. And hopefully labor costs will go down a bit and availability of builders and um, traders will be increase. You know, I think on the moment it's really hard to get people doing the job. Um, so that will be good if there's a bit more availability in that area. With the interest rates, uh, you know, there are a bit rumors that it will stay what it is now, but I don't think we can say anything about that. Hmm. Yeah, it's I think probably a really good time to to build it yourself now. Huge cost savings in that respect. You know, if you don't have to hire all that labor all yourself. Hmm. So, so um, yeah, absolutely. For, for, for in that way, you, you will save money. Yeah, I think with the with the interest rates going up and then lending criteria is tightened as well um, just in recent months and so that's affecting some projects that people are planning on building and they've either paused or fallen over mm -hmm. so I've heard like that there are builders out there that are um, not signing the contracts that they maybe were expecting so I think the industry is in that way is a little bit uncertain at the moment so it would be interesting to see how that pans out over the rest of the year do material costs ever come down? I've never seen it. I would <laughs> love it if it did, but I've never seen it. No. The, yeah. uh, this is kind of a, an aligned question. So, uh, sorry if I've mispronounced your name. Is it uh, Eilis, perhaps? Um, is, is wondering how long does it take you from the completion of your plans to starting the physical build? So I think what, you know, they're pointing to there is lead times. Um, yeah. And, you know, again, I, I, I tend to think this is potentially a how long is a piece of string depending on availability, but I'm keen to hear from the panel. Uh, I can say something about it, and it's, it's a bit of a personal story as well. So we had all the um, approvals in place and uh, we got the finance in place as well. And at that time, I had a couple of quotes from a concreter, you know, to do the slab. Uh, I can advise people to do always get subcontractors in to do the slab, you know, because that's really sets your whole build in measurements and in quality. Um, but I can really remember the, the night before I signed the contract with, with, the, with the concrete, because that's a, a 30 grand uh quote it was you know so it's the first big spending on your bill and it's also that you realize ah there's no way back anymore now <laughs> i have to finish it <laughs> so yeah makes it very real yeah <laughs> very real and I, I was very nervous and uh my family just said just go for it and yeah that's it. Yeah. Um, oh sorry james go i ahead. was just gonna add that from getting approvals to actually digging uh, on site and doing groundworks and plumbing and so forth. Um, might have been a month or two. It wasn't, it wasn't very long till, till those kind of contractors were available to hit the ground. Great. Yeah, sometimes I think perhaps if you have a builder, the lead time can be longer um, than, than if you're just subcontracting out the, all of the trades yourself. So mm -hmm. um, we've only got time for one more question. It feels like this session has absolutely flown. Um, so 
this, this is more of a technical question, perhaps, um, Kirsty, you might be well placed to answer this. What happens uh, when you sell the house? For example, warranties, um, does the buyer have to be legally told that it was an owner build? Yep. Okay. In New South Wales, um, I, I can't speak for the other states, but assume there's probably something quite similar. If you sell your house within seven years of completion as an owner builder, you do need to take out insurance. Um, and it effectively covers for that defects insurance, which home warranty insurance would cover um, like if you had a, if you had a builder. So yeah. if it's over seven years, presumably if anything went wrong, it would have gone wrong and anything that goes wrong after that's probably from deterioration or wear and tear. Um, but at least in New South Wales, if you sell within seven years, you do need to have um, uh, insurance uh, for that, that um, uh, the quality of the build if there's any, yeah. if there's any it's likewise in major in defects. Victoria. Yeah. Yeah. Good information to have. With um, with time running short, um, a quick, succinct answer from each of you, perhaps. What would be perhaps your key takeaway you'd want um, anyone considering owner building to take away? James, perhaps if I start with you. All right. I think if you're passionate about your own house, house and you want to be a part of that creative process, and you can handle the stress of day-to-day -day life and and taking on a build, go for it. But if uh, if all those things spook you a bit, maybe don't do it. <laughs> Roger? Yeah, I agree with James, absolutely. You need that passion. And I would really like to add good design and good drawings, you know, because the design, if the house is really nice and you really see it coming to, uh, to life while you go, it gives you that motivation to finish it. So, yeah, make sure you've got the design you really want. Good yeah. advice. And Kirsty? Uh, my advice will, will is things will go wrong <laughs> and you can get through it. Um, there was a moment yeah. during my build True. where I was having problems with a supplier and I just drilled through an electrical cable and things were just going really badly. And I just, I sat down and cried. And I just, it was just, the stress was huge. <clears throat> And then I had this moment. I thought, oh my gosh, this is this moment in grand design where the owner sit down and cry. And it's like, I'm having this moment. This means it's part of my journey. I'm past that bit in the episode where the owners cry. And I can move on. You know, so, so the answer is don't expect everything to go brilliantly. You can't control everything. Okay. Things will go wrong, but you can get through it, is my mm -hmm. advice. Mm. Good advice. Good advice. And and once the house is finished, you forget all the pain. Well, that's very true. There's a big reward at the end, isn't there? And I think that's a really great note to to end on. We've I'm really sorry, everyone. We've come to the um, end of time for this session. Thank you all so much for joining us, Kirsty, James, and Roger, and of course everyone who's listening online. Stay tuned, everyone, for our next session. That's all about uh, designing for accessibility and ageing in place. And so that's starting at 11 o'clock. And lastly, um, just before you jump off this session, a reminder that becoming a member to renew throughout Sustainable House Day will put you in the draw for that electric scooter from Benzina, valued at five grand. Um, I really want one. Uh, you'll also support Renew to host great events like Sustainable House Day. And we we are a not-for-profit. Um, we do um, do a lot of, uh, provide a lot of information and value for free. So every membership, every subscription or donation is deeply appreciated and it helps us to continue to do our work. So thank you. I hope you've all enjoyed our first session and we look forward to seeing you in the next one at 11 o'clock. Thank you. Thanks, thank you. Thank you and enjoy the rest of your sustainable house day. <laughs> Thanks all.